Now it's time for our first speaker for keynote speech, Mr. Mustafa Akol, political commentator and author from Turkey, with the case, a Muslim case for liberty. Well, good afternoon, and thank you so much. Thanks uh, for Al Jazeera and the new Bulgarian University for organizing this event and for hosting me here. Uh, this is my first time in Bulgaria. It's been two hours, and so far it's going great, and I hope I'll enjoy the rest of our stay. Uh, and uh, since I look forward to enjoying Bulgarian cuisine uh, at lunch, I won't, you know, also overextend my time, and I know you will I prefer a, a little, maybe a shorter topic than an hour. Uh, so I will um, make a uh, brief presentation, uh, a talk, and I would love to get your questions and ideas after, if you, we can have a question and answer session at the end. Uh, so I think the reason why I'm invited here is to speak about this issue of Islam and freedom. Uh, and the reason is that, well, first, I wrote a book about this, a book titled Islam Without Extremes, A Muslim Case for Liberty. Uh, but the reason I wrote about this book is, I think, of course, a larger story. The reason why I wrote a book like that and why there is so much discussion about Islam, democracy, and freedom in the world uh, is that some political events that happened in the past few decades brought this issue to the fore, brought this issue of Islam and politics to the agenda of the world, in particular the Western agenda. Uh, and of course, one of these events was the most horrible event of 9-11 in the United States. Uh, and since then, especially since 9-11, there has been much talk uh, in the West about how Islam influences politics. And I think some of this talk was not very accurate, and I think it was overly suspicious about Islam and how it can influence politics. Uh, here's an example, you know, I chose for you a quote uh, from an American thinker, Marvin Olasky, uh, whose works, who's a conservative American thinker and whose works uh, have inspired some people in the Bush administration. So he's from that side of, side of the you know, US uh, political spectrum. And in an article titled, Brutality and Dictatorship, how Islam affects society, Olaski argued, quote, because Islam in many ways trains people not to govern themselves, but to be governed by dictates, Muslim countries are always run by dictators, end of quote. In other words, he basically said, there are many dictatorships in the uh, Islam, what we call uh, Islamic uh, world, the Muslim countries of the world. And the reason is that Islam tells people to obey these dictators. And that's why we have all the dictatorships in the Arab world. Now, that's a pretty standard argument that I've been hearing uh, since 9-11 in the US. Uh, and th this also led to the accusation of Islam as a potentially potential threat to democracy and freedom in the world. And it, it's, it's been an interpretive tool used by many foreign policy experts or the Middle Eastern experts. But was this true? Was really Islam the reason why we had dictatorships in what we call Muslim majority countries? Well, actually, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to see that there is some problem with this argument. Uh, because it is true that the Middle East, until the Arab uprisings, was a region that was devoid of democracy, with a few exceptions. And you had dictatorships in many countries, in many Muslim-majority countries, in Iraq, in Syria, in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Libya, in Yemen, and you, you name it, in Saudi Arabia, in Iran, you can add all these. However, there was one interesting catch here. Most of the dictatorships in these countries were not justifying themselves on the basis of Islam. They were actually dictator, dictatorial regimes with a secular character. I mean, the Saddam Hussein regime in Iraq was not an Islamic regime. Uh, the 
uh, the, the tyranny in Syria, which is still fighting and killing, you know, the insurgents. In, uh, I mean, which is not allowing free elections in Syria and killing the people who fight for free elections. It was not justifying itself as an uh, Islamic regime. Uh, in, in, in Tunisia, the, sec the, the regime, the authoritarian regime, was very secular. It was so secular that it was banning the Islamic headscarf on Tunisian streets. Uh, in Egypt, again, the Husni Mubarak regime was not, and uh, constitution had some references to Islam, but Husni Mubarak as a political character was mentioned as a secular character, not an Islamic character. In other words, if this argument were true, what we would see should be, well, Islamist dictatorships, but quite the contrary, most of the Middle East had secular dictatorships, and the people who are inspired by Islam in their politics, the people that we broadly call the Islamists, were generally in the opposition. They were in the opposition in Egypt, they were in the opposition in Tunisia, they were in opposition in Syria, they are still in opposition in Syria. In Iraq, they were the people, again, who were oppressed by the Saddam regime and they had to flee Iraq and, and they had to organize themselves in different ways. Uh, and interestingly, actually, these Islamists were, in most of these countries, were the biggest opposition groups. And actually, they were the harshly oppressed opposition groups. The Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt has always been an opposition group from the time it was devised in the 1920s. Uh, so, when you see this picture, I think we should revisit what Marvin Olaski says, that Islam compels people to obey dictators. That's why we have dictators in the Middle East. When you see this picture, I think we should think that, while well, maybe there is a problem with authoritarian politics in the Middle East, and there are authoritarian political structures, but Islam is not necessarily the cause of these authoritarian regimes, dictatorial regimes. Uh, of course, there were a few Islamically inspired or justified dictatorships as well. Well, I call Saudi Arabian system as a dictatorship in the sense that it's not a modern state, like a modern republic, but it's not a democracy, it's an authoritarian regime. Or Iran, which has some democratic features, uh, like a parliament still has an authoritarian you know, elite which is running the country, you can call it an authoritarian regime. Uh, we can also uh, name Sudan. But the thing is, when you look at all the all this whole picture in the Middle East, it emerged that Islam was not producing dictatorships. There was a general authoritarian culture and a trend in the Middle East, which was sometimes justifying itself with Islam in, in the case of Saudi Arabia, but most of the time it was actually justifying itself on secular grounds and, and regimes had a secular character, these dictatorial regimes. Uh, that's why instead of thinking Islam produces dictatorship, I think we had to ask why there are dictatorships, why there are authoritarian regimes in the Middle East, and how does it influence Islam and in the way it articulates itself in politics. Now, when I'm calling dictatorship what I'm talking about, I mean, of course, one party states, authoritarian regimes, you can't change the leadership. But also, I'm talking about an authoritarian political culture. An authoritarian culture which presumes that the government can dictate on society a certain way of life, a certain religion, a certain philosophy. Uh, again, on this department, what has become very famous or notorious in the West is the authoritarianism that came from uh, supposedly Islamic actors or you know, self-declared Islamic actors, like Taliban in, 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 uh, in Afghanistan, which was, the, of course, the harshest uh, case, or again, the Saudi regime or the Iranian regime. And of course, these authoritarian political cultures came uh, to Western media with examples such as a, uh, an enforcement on women to abide by certain norms, like the famous uh, decree in Saudi Arabia that every woman has to wear a headscarf, or in Iran, if you're a woman, you have to wear a headscarf. This was also, again, uh, taken as an example that, you know, if Islam influenced politics, you will have examples like this. It will inevitably impose a certain way of life on, uh, on society as we see in Iran and Saudi Arabia. Now, I did not grow up in Iran. I did not grow up in Saudi Arabia. I grew up in Turkey, and I'm coming from Turkey. And in Turkey, we don't have a government which imposes women to put a headscarf on. Uh, in Turkey, we don't have an Islamic state. Uh, the state is a secular state. 
Uh, and we don't have religious police, morality police, going around the streets of Istanbul or Ankara, forcing women to cover their head or forcing men to go to mosque. But in Turkey, until very recently, we used to have what I call the secularism police. These were the people waiting at the Turkish ga univer uh, university gates, the doors of the universities, checking every female student and telling every female student to take the headscarf off if she had one. Now, when I actually first time compared these two examples, I said, hmm, in Saudi Arabia, you have an authoritarian regime which tells women to put the headscarf on. In Turkey, you have an other authoritarian logic which tells women to put the headscarf off. And I think it's similarly authoritarian. I mean, a regime which tells people what to wear is by definition authoritarian. And when I saw these things, I said, okay, the problem again is not maybe Islam itself, but an authoritarian political culture that happens to be strong in this part of the world. And which doesn't necessarily come from Islam because it also comes from secular actors. And maybe the solution would be a general liberalization of this political culture. And, and Islam will probably be a part of this liberalization. Islam can be on the liberal side or on the authoritarian side. Anyway, I think this was the general scene before the Arab Spring. Uh, and I think the scene was that Islam was not the reason why we had authoritarian regimes, but Islam was being influenced by the authoritarian regimes in power in the sense that the Islamists were generally oppressed by these regimes and you had radicalization among some of those Islamists because the more they oppressed, the more they, some of them felt that, well, they maybe need armed struggle against the regime as we have seen in some of the violent offshoots from the Ikhwan and Muslimin, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. The Arab Spring, the Arab revolutions, whatever we call it, the Arab awakening, really created a rupture in this whole historic you know, continuation. It created a new reality in front of our eyes. And this new reality was this. Arab peoples, in first in Tunisia, then in Egypt, then Libya, and Yemen, and Bahrain, although it didn't you know, succeed well, and in Syria, obviously, have revolted against long-time authoritarian regimes. They have revolted against regimes in which they had no right to change the political structure. And uh, among, the, among the social segments that revolted against these lo long-time dictators, you had the Islamists as well. You had the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt as well, which not right away, maybe after maybe a little hesitation, joined the Tahrir Square protest. And now, as you know, after the elections in Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood came to power. And there's a new political process going on. In Tunisia, you had Nahda, the longtime Islamic party in Tunisia, which was suppressed by the Ben Ali regime, and Nahda entered elections and actually came to power. Uh, if there are free elections in Syria one day, inshallah, uh, probably the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood will be a dominant factor in Syrian politics because it has a lot of support in society. In other words, Islamists, rather than supporting dictatorships, actually rebelled against them and joined the democratic process, which will you know, replace these dictatorships and initiate a whole new era in this, in this whole uh, new era that we can call in the Middle East. However, this doesn't guarantee one thing. This doesn't guarantee that the, 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 uh, the democracies that are emerging in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Libya, hopefully in Syria, it doesn't guarantee that these democracies will be liberal democracies. Uh, and I think that's a, here's an important you know, political terminology nuance here. Because in the West, when people speak of democracy, people presume it's a liberal democracy. Democracy is a political procedure. The, uh, the people who run the country come to power with, elect uh, with elect uh, electoral votes. They come to power through ballots. And they, they are responsible to the people. And that's that's basic definition of democracy. And liberalism is a political philosophy which says rights of every individual should be secured and democracy cannot violate the rights of every rights of individuals. And these individual rights are you know, listed you know, in constitution and they're secured. That's, that's why there is a synthesis called liberal democracy. Now, in the Middle East, a democratic process has begun, but there are some questions with, regard, with regards to liberalism. For example, in Egypt, the big, next big question is that when Muslim Brotherhood comes to power, 
and well, they are in power right now with Mohamed Morsi. But if the new constitution takes place, and if the parliament in Egypt again uh, strongly dominated by the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafis and the Nur Party, you know their party in Egypt, uh, if this process goes on, this will be a democratic process. But will it be a liberal process? Will the rights of Egyptian individuals, women, minorities? Uh, secular Egyptians, will their rights be secured in this new era? So I think the big next big debate is not in the Middle East, is not democracy as a procedure, because all the Islamists now accept democracy. Uh, but it's about these political freedoms that are generally defined as the, uh, as the liberal principles uh, in politics. Now, there are some possible tensions here between the vision of the Islamist parties that are democratically legitimate, uh, there are tensions between, some possible tensions between them and the, these liberal principles that I've been talking about. What are these? These are some tensions that exist in classical interpretations of Islamic law and political liberalism as it is understood you know, in universal or Western terms. Not everything that is Western is universal, of course, but maybe some things are like, like democracy or individual freedoms or human rights. What tensions? For example, in classical Islamic law, there is a ban on apostasy. Apostasy meaning changing your religion from one thing to another. Classical Islamic law regards apostasy as a crime so it means that if you say, well, I used to be a Muslim, but I've changed my mind, I become a Christian, you're an apostate, and Islamic law decrees that penalty on you. Uh, this has become a controversial issue in the West uh, because a few incidents of apostasy were punished by death penalty in Afghanistan, then Iran, you know, this issue goes on. And, and it is obviously a, here, here's obviously a tension between the notions of Islamic law and the, and the notions of individual freedom and religious freedom that, that is you know, commonly defined in the world today. So if, for example, the Muslim Brotherhood, the, a, a parliament in Egypt dominated by the Muslim Brotherhood, passes a law which says apostasy is a crime and, the, uh, and it's punishable by death, it would be democratic in the sense that the majority of the parliament can pass this, but it would not be liberal. Here you have attention. Or if the Egyptian parliament or the Tunisian parliament or any other parliament in the, in the Middle East, that will be more, you know, uh, have an Islamic, Islamist party uh, majority, passes a law which says uh, alcohol is banned or certain th uh, behaviors that are considered are banned through government force and there will be a piety police which will impose these, you know, these particular norms that can be democratic in the sense that a majority will obviously pass these laws. But it will not be liberal in the sense that some people will say, well, our freedoms are being taken away by the government. Here are the tensions. But, however, the good news is that there are possible ways to reinterpret Islamic law which will actually solve these problems, problems from a liberal perspective. Like on the issue of apostasy. If you listen to thinkers like Rashid Ghannoushi, the, uh, the ideological leader or the philosophical leader of uh, Nahda and Nahda party in Tunisia. Rashid Ghanoushi will explain to you, and I agree with him, that the ban on apostasy in classical Islamic law is actually a ban on changing your side in battle. Because the early Muslim thinkers, when they were saying apostasy is a crime, they were thinking Muslim army having another army, there's a war, and they were understanding apostasy as changing your side in war. And since the context has changed in the modern world today, since changing your religion doesn't mean anything about your you know, political allegiance, it doesn't mean changing your side in battle, that whole context should be reinterpreted and you know, apostasy bans should be abandoned. So there are people who now reinterpret this ban, uh, like Rashid Khan Nushi this way, but there are people, some Salafis in Egypt will probably insist that no, no reinterpretation is possible. It's written in our text that apostasy is a crime, it should be... Uh, so how do we interpret Islamic law becomes a very important issue if Islamic law will be implemented in these countries. There are also tensions about the 
imposition of piety. Some Muslim thinkers would say, uh, when I say imposition of piety, for example, I refer to the, uh, the Mutawwa, the religious police in Saudi Arabia. They basically patrol the streets and force everybody uh, on the, uh, every Saudi citizen at the very least to abide by what they think is Islamic laws. Like women should be covered, men should go to the uh, mosque when prior, uh, prayer time comes. Uh, and so on and so forth. So there are some Islamic scholars who think that yes, this is Islamically necessary, but there are other scholars who think that, who refer to the Quranic course, there is no compulsion in religion, and that these, uh, these authoritarian injunctions are really not a part of Islam, or at least they should be reformed. So the interpretation of Islamic law is very key here. And when I look in the Arab world, there are scholars with more liberal views, like Rashid Ghanoushi, there are scholars with much more conservative views, and there are also Salafi groups which would even reject to discuss any of these, and so this will be an issue. Therefore, the next big issue is not democracy as a political system. Everybody accepts democracy as a political system right now in Egypt. Uh, the next big issue is these political freedoms and individual freedoms and, and, and in terms of piety, morality, and faith, and so on and so forth. But here's one thing from a Turkish perspective. There is one very important Islamic authority who faced these issues actually and who found very liberal solutions and made some very important liberal reforms uh, more than a century ago. Who's that Islamic authority? Well, it was the Ottoman Empire. Uh, the Ottoman Empire, you know, as you know, was a big state. It actually covered all these three regions, the Middle East, North Africa, and the Balkans, but connects these three regions that they were all the Ottoman Empire uh, until about a century ago. And I know people have different ideas about the Ottoman Empire. We Turks tend to like it more, and some Arabs don't like it. And I know in Bulgaria, there's a history of criticism towards the Ottoman Empire, and I all understand and welcome that. Uh, but there's one thing interesting about the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire was the seat of the Islamic Caliphate until 1924. It had a very important Islamic authority. Uh, and it was ruling all these lands, especially Arab Middle East was a part of the Ottoman Empire until the 20th century. In the, in, the 20th, uh, in the 19th century, the Ottoman Empire initiated a very important reform process that we call the Tanzimat, reorganization. The Tanzimat, which began with an imperial edict in 1839, was basically the effort by the Ottoman elite to incorporate liberal democratic norms from the West and reconcile them with Islam. For example, why the Ottomans did this? Well, not just because they were you know, lovers of democracy for no reason. Well, they were understanding that there are rebellions in the empire. There are national liberation movements, the Serbs and the Greeks. They wanted to keep the empire intact. So they wanted to make the empire more free, more equal, so that you know, people would be more loyal to the empire. Uh, for example, with the reform edict of 1839, they introduced the idea of individual rights that cannot be violated by the state. It became a part of Ottoman thinking and it became an imperial. So the Sultan could not violate these rights. More importantly, with the reform of 1856, uh, 1850, yeah, 1856, the Islahat Farman, as we call it, or the reform edict, the Ottomans declared Jews and Christians of the Ottoman Empire as equal citizens. They're, they still, as, uh, I mean, Jews and Christians are not, would not be equal citizens in Saudi Arabia today, but the Ottoman Empire declared them as equal citizens and they hence joined the Ottoman Parliament, which was convened in 1876. The Ottoman Empire faced the issue of apostasy because there was a lot of missionary activity in the Ottoman Empire and the apostasy laws of the Ottoman Empire became an issue and in 1850s, the Ottoman Empire officially abolished apostasy laws. So it became possible to change your religion in late Ottoman Empire. Uh, the Ottoman ulema justified these reforms by saying that Islamic law should be adaptable to times and the state has the legitimate right to make legal reforms if it sees benefit for the society. Uh, Ottoman thinker Ahmed Cevdet Pasha actually wrote in his famous uh, collection of Islamic law, new, new codification of Islamic law called Mejalle. In the beginning he wrote, as times change, laws should change. So that was the vision of the Ottoman Empire. So th there has been many important reforms. And most importantly, Ottoman Empire did not realize these reforms 
thinking that the empire was abandoning Islam or abandoning its loyalty to Islam. But they, real, they did these in a way which is respectful to Islamic tradition, but brought as a change within the Islamic tradition. Ottoman thinker Naomi Kemal, who emphasized liberty as the most important political principle, he was the one, one of the early thinkers in the Muslim world to say that the Quranic principle of shura, or consultation, can be likened to the idea of participatory democracy you know, in the Western uh, political language. So I'm not going into all the details about an Ottoman lawyer. And I think in this university, there are people who know the Ottoman Empire much better than me. Because uh, as I just learned today, we abandoned some of the Ottoman archives. And, and Bulgaria was you know, wise enough to you know, get them, I think, in the 20s. We Turks had an unnecessary period of de rejecting our Ottoman past and you know, acting as if we had nothing to do with the Ottoman Empire. But that period is gone, thankfully. We are rediscovering, too. But what is important is that there are many important political, theological, jurisp jurisprudence-related discussions in late Ottoman Empire that I got into my book. And Ottomans dealt with these issues that the Egyptian parliament will be discussing in the years to come. So maybe it's a good idea to look back how Ottoman liberals discussed these issues in the 19th century. Now, as a Turk, that's one thing I can point out, the, Turkish, the Ottoman experience. But there's also there's something else that I want to point out as well. That is the modern Turkish experience, the Turkish experience, the Turkish Islamic experience under the Turkish Republic. The Ottoman Empire was an Islamic state, obviously. And the Turkish Republic, which was created in 1923 in, in place of the Ottoman Empire, was and still is a secular republic. Uh, now, our secularism has gone too far, like it was in Tunisia, and we had a problem with that for a long time, like this ban on headscarves that you know, Turkey used to have until very recently. And that is a very problematic aspect of Turkish secularism that I've been always critical, and I'll be critical of it in the future if secularism in Turkey still means uh, depriving people from, you know, uh, from their rights to live religiously if they want to live religiously. However, living under the secular state also gave Turkey's pious Muslim an important experience. Throughout the Turkish Republic, in this whole 80 years of secular rule, Turkey's pious conservative Muslims, who still wanted to live by you know, Islamic uh, norms and values, they organized themselves in civil society, and they have been able to flourish. They have been able to nurture their faith without the state support without the states actually, sometimes despite the states, you know, measures uh, against religion. Now, this is important because in, in, in the authoritarian mind that we see in, in, in the Middle East, when we speak about freedom, some Muslims think, what do you mean by freedom? People will be able to buy alcohol and able to commit sin. What do you mean freedom? So women will be able to walk around without a headscarf? Now, my answer is yes, that is what I mean by freedom. And I think that's a good thing for everybody, including Muslims themselves. Because in Turkey, thanks to that, the people who remained pious Muslims are pious Muslims out of their own genuine, sincere commitment to faith. In other words, in Turkey, nobody forces you to go to the mosque. Nobody forces you to wear the headscarf. So you wear the headscarf or you go to the mosque because you really want to worship God. And uh, Turkish society has not become secularized, as you know, some of the secularists imagined. They have created civil society institutions, they have created charities, they have created uh, important media networks, and today the great part of a Turkish society is still very religious. I have a friend who lived in Iran for a while, and he had told me that the number of people in Turkey who fast in Ramadan he said, well, according to his observations, is really not lower than uh, the number of people in, uh, who fast in Iran. And he said it's probably higher. More people fast in Istanbul in Ramadan than in Tehran, especially North Tehran, if you know, if you know the country. And now, that is interesting because I Iran is a sec Isla Islamic republic, which imposes Islamic norms. Turkey is a secular state, which doesn't impose any norms. But Turkish people are still religious in great amounts, and because they really genuinely believe. Whereas the Iranian system, or the Saudi system, in which you have a morality police that imposes a religion, you have another problem, and that problem is the problem of hypocrisy. Some people, uh, you know, in Saudi Arabia, they have to wear the hijab, and they have to show up in the mosque, but they sometimes go to London to, you know, go to the nightclubs to have the 
you know, wireless parties, which is their right, but we chose that if your purpose is to nurture religiosity, you cannot really achieve this true religious police. You can only achieve this true persuasion and you know, winning hearts and minds, and you can do this by charity and in, civil, in the base of civil society. I think that's a big lesson from a Turkish experience, that liberty, freedom, a basis of freedom in which the government does not dictate a certain way of life to you is actually the best medium to be a good Muslim, because then you will be a good Muslim based on your conviction and not by the dictate of any police. Based on this, I see a ground for Muslim liberalism that is already emerging in Turkey. And I think that uh, it will, as, as you know, discussions unfold in Egypt and uh, Tunisia and other countries, this will be an issue, this whole issue of freedoms and, and how do we balance them in, 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 uh, with democracy. And I think the liberal democratic synthesis that has emerged in the West, after so many mistaken political models, we know the history of the West, will ultimately, I think, flourish in the Muslim world as well. Thank you so much for your attention, and I've maybe spoken too much. I would love to get your comments, questions, protests, if you have and any, any feedback. Thank you so much. Do we need a microphone? Or? Any questions? There is a question there. Bye bye. It can be in Turkish if you want, since you speak Turkish. Thank you very much. I have another lecture. Bulgaria? In Bulgaria? Oh, in English, actually. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so uh, my name is Krasimir Janko, for those who don't know me, and uh, thank you for your presentation, it was really interesting. My question for you is, uh, the, the Turkish model, or the Ottoman model, which uh, began in uh, the middle of the 19th century, uh, well, it's of course um, a good thing, but do, do you think that this effort to replicate uh, what happened in Turkey and right now, that it tries to be the model of what should happen in Egypt and uh, other uh, Muslim countries in the Middle East, uh, do you think that uh, it's applicable? Because, uh, in, for example, in Saudi Arabia, maybe, in other places in the Middle East, uh, you have uh, different, um, different contexts. For example, uh, tribalism, to some extent, loyalties to tribes and uh, other norms. Do, do you think that uh, perhaps replicating the Turkish model uh, won't work in uh, Egypt and other places in, uh, in the region? Thank you so much. First of all, I'm not advocating replicating, you know, Turkish model. Uh, first of all, it's not possible. Secondly, Turkish model has a lot of problems there as well. Please don't replicate everything we do in Turkey, you know, in, in the Middle East. I mean, please don't replicate how we dealt with the Kurds for eight decades, like by banning their language, for example. So I, I'm not saying that Turkey is a heaven of liberal democracy. We still have a lot of, we've made important reforms in the past 10 years, maybe 20 years, but still have a lot of problems. So. I'm advocating a wonderful model here that everybody should replicate. Secondly, of course, every society find, will find its own way to democracy. No democratic experience is similar to any, anything else. Uh, in the West, too, I mean, there are so many different models of democracy. Some Western countries are monarchies. Some things are some one of the republic, republics. There are even different standards. You know, uh, like freedom of speech in the U.S. is different than you know freedom of speech in in, in Germany. So there will be differences. There are also, like, even different moral standards in the West lead to different laws. In the United States, you cannot drink b before 21. In Amsterdam, you can do everything you can imagine when you're, I don't know, 16 or something. So there are, societies have different values and they will influence legal processes inevitably. So there will be differences. However, Islamic movements, if we're speaking about them, they are by nature international. So what, whatever the Islamists in Turkey, the current, for example, the Justice and Development Party, they don't call themselves Islamists, and I think by classical definitions, they're not. But they are obviously a political party with a lot of pious Muslims in it, including leadership type Erdogan. Whatever they do has some influence on what, you know, how people think in Egypt or Nahda about the future of democracy. 
not, it will, not that it will be replicated, but inspires change. I should say that Arab thinkers have influenced Turkey a lot in the 20th century. Rashid Ganushi's uh, emphasis on democracy was welcomed in Turkey in the 90s because his books were translated into Turkish. Uh, and it influenced some of the you know, liberal thinkers in the Islamic camp. So there is an inevitable and, uh, connection uh, because there's a whole idea of the ummah. The, and when people were, hear the word ummah, they sometimes freak out and they think it's necessarily a pan-Islamic totalitarian vision. It doesn't have to be that way. It is inevitable that Islamic parties that are inspired from Islam in different levels are connected to each other and they look at each other's experience. That's why I think the Turkish experience, the experience of Islam in Turkey with regards to democracy and an open society, a relatively open society, might be a maybe source of inspiration for uh, the actors in Tunisia, Egypt, hopefully in Syria, uh, who, and other countries, uh, of course, Muslim majority countries. And it is already having some impact. I mean, I think the Turkish case has become interesting uh, as a case study for some observers in the Arab world in the past decade. As a Turk, I'm happy to see that, but again, I should say that nothing should be replicated. It cannot be replicated, and we have also problems in Turkey as well, and I can talk about them for another hour if you want, but today I'm speaking about the nice size of Turkey. Thank you. Um, my name is Dimitar Bechev, um, head of uh, European Council for Relations here in Sofia. So, Mustafa, welcome. It's a great pleasure to have you Thank you. Uh, in the city of ours. Uh, I was provoked by a comment you made at the outset that there is a problem with authoritarian culture, which of course reminds me of what a lot of liberals in Turkey are saying these days, that uh, at the end of the day, the authoritarian gene in, in the state system now is fused with the popular politics of the AKP. In other words, the Kemalist authoritarian uh, instinct has allied with the liberal mm -hmm. but representative um, mandate of, of the AKP, there is this fusion, mm -hmm. which probably is not a new story because after the coup in 1980, it was the military which allied with um, Islamist politics, right? With, um, for example, religious education was reintroduced. And now a lot of critics in Turkey would say that the government is actually encouraging pious lifestyles. For example, taxation on alcohol. Um, and there may be some um, parallels in Egypt when Morsi opts for a policy which is heavy-handed, but at the same time representing half of the society. Um, so how do we um, respond to those arguments? Mm -hmm. How do we deal with the political culture that might be secular in its origins and un-Islamic, but at the same time has this um, kind of... Um, <coughs> how shall I put it, the, the quality of fusing again with Islamist politics or Islamist-inspired politics. Um, how do we make sure that a liberal mix is not pretty stable and actually undermines the liberal case? Thanks, Dimitar. You're really taking me to the not-so-nice part of the Turkish story, and it's important, obviously. Here's this thing. If you're talking about the current governing party, the AKP, the Justice and Development Party in Turkey, I basically have a simple motto about the AKP when, when I speak about the problems with the AKP. I say AKP is not too Islamic, AKP is too Turkish. In the sense that, well, they're not, they have some authoritarian tendencies. Prime Minister has an authoritarian tone and style. It is not coming from any Sharia based uh, Islamic jurisprudence vision. It is coming from the Turkish style of politics in which you always have a strong leader with his fist on the table most of the time and uh, really bashing his opponents and his supporters cheering for him. And he, there's some part nepotism, they bring their own people to bureaucracy all the time and then the other party comes, they do the same thing. So we have structural problems in our political culture, maybe in other countries, probably you have, the, these are universal problems most of them, but uh, some countries at least have created some systemic, you know, uh, they have built a political culture, also some systemic blocks to these problems. In Turkey, so we have these problems. For example, uh, the current government, I mean, Prime Minister's tone and style is always a matter in Turkey. And however, I should tell you, this is a, also a personal issue. Abdullah Gül, the president of Turkey, who comes from the exact same political vision with Erdogan, the same political party, AKP, he's 
actually praised by Turkish liberals most of the time as a leader of moderation and, and, and as someone who defends political freedoms and EU norms still in Turkey and so on and so forth. So there are sometimes matters of style and personality and so on and so forth. Uh, and I should also say, as time goes by, as the AKP stays in power for longer and longer, and as the opposition is always unpromising and the opposition always very weak and really incapable, the AKP's grip on power is getting stronger, and that leads to a certain, you know, rise of a certain authoritarian rhetoric. However, in Turkey, uh, I think the discussions we have on religion, if you come to that point, are generally the discussions that you would have in any normal uh, country, like in any democratic country. For example, the, uh, Erdogan was criticized a lot for bringing the idea that abortion should be banned or limited in Turkey. Now, this doesn't, you don't have to be Saudi Arabia to have a problem with abortion. I mean, in America, this is discussed as well. In Ireland, abortion is banned because basically you, there is the life of the un, unborn, which is a value, you know, human life. So your concern for the life of the unborn can lead you, even from liberal principles, to have a, pr a problem with abortion. So I think Turkish liberals, I think they are sometimes right to criticize the AKP, but sometimes Turkish liberals have their own political take on issues, and they expect the AKP to agree with them on, AKP will not agree with them on moral conservative family sort of issues. I, but I think these are legitimate discussions in, in any, any democracy. We, we, the discussion in Turkey is not whether women should be able to wear, uh, women should wear the I mean, the discussion is not that w whether the government should force everybody to wear the headscarf. The discussion is still whether a woman can wear the headscarf and become a public you know, employee. So still we have a secularism that is really authoritarian in Turkey and still we're dealing with that. So there are obvious problems with the AKP and I think they're becoming more visible in the third term, but these are really not the problems of AKPs imposing the Sharia, you know, sort of thing. Yes, please. Thank you, Mustafa, for your speech. I have another question, maybe building on the two questions that already came. Uh, my name is Maria Petkov from Oxford University. Uh, you were talking about democracy and you were talking about elections, but I think you missed one point when talking on this topic, uh, which is what happens when the time comes for power change. So when the AKP or the Muslim Brotherhood, for example, in Egypt, do not get re-elected, First of all, would they allow this to happen in terms of legislation and in terms of maybe committing the same crimes in, uh, in terms of uh, election rigging as the former regimes did? And um, what would happen uh, at the point where they are not re-elected? Would they give up power peacefully? And if you look at, uh, just to just add something small, if you look at the Muslim Brotherhood and Nahda project, for example, there is no plan for when they go back into opposition. The whole plan is to stay in power and build a country. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I didn't mention this uh, potential problem, which is obviously important, uh, but because it is not a problem that is anything to do with Islam per se. It's a problem with power. I mean, every political party can have this problem. I mean, and actually, we've just seen it. I mean, the whole six years of Ba'ath rule in Egypt and in Syria. So. The problem is, so there are, these are structural problems in, in where you have in Latin America as well, you have in other countries as well. Where you have a fragile democracy, one of the problems is that a party can win elections and establish it with authoritarian means so that nobody, able, nobody will be able to win this again. Is this a problem? It's a problem for everybody, but this is not an Islamic problem, it's an issue. Uh, Putin is very, you know, very good example of, you know, this kind of secular authoritarianism in Russia. In that sense, uh, this should be definitely addressed. But I was particularly looking at the potential issues with regards to Islam and politics in the future of the Middle East. Uh, but, 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 like, for example, we have these centralized, powerful states uh, in the Middle East, very little civil society, very centralized power structures. These are all very big problems, but they are universal problems that we see in four corners of the globe, including the Middle East. But that's important. But I don't see any doctrinal reason why the Ikhwan should be uh, preparing itself for eternal rule. I mean, from their point of view, they can have a doctrinal issue with the Sharia, 
that I mean they can be Islamically, uh, uh, you know, driven to implement Sharia in authoritarian ways if they Im insist on you know implementing literally without any reform. Uh, but as for uh, staying in power forever, this is a power-hungry you know personality or like party type, and it is unfortunately it's very widespread. Yes, and that's important. My name is uh, Harry Salishic, I'm from Al Jazeera. So before I ask anything disclaimer, <laughs> question has nothing to do with my employer. It's <laughs> totally mine. Uh, where do you think this leads the world? We have like uh, many Muslim countries uh, disposing dictators, becoming more liberal and more democratic. And at the same time, we have countries whom we perceive as democratic like Denmark and France, who actually become xenophobic and impose racist laws on their own citizens, and them actually regulating the clothing of their own citizens. So where does this shift lead the world, what do you, in your own opinion? That's a great question, and I think this, you're very right, we see in particularly European countries a rise of racism on the one hand, extreme far-right parties that are fascists, you know, by most definitions, like the so-called Freedom Party in uh, Holland, that are anything against against anything that is non-Dutch class in the classical sense. Uh, that's one problem. On the other hand, governments passing some laws like the ban on the burqa in France, and, uh, which is, I think, very illiberal. I mean, to a government issuing a decree on what people will wear, that is wrong if the Taliban does it. That's wrong if the French parliament does it. I think it's very similarly all wrong. So we have these problems. And I think these problems, first of all, show that Democracy can be fragile everywhere. And I think it's wrong to think that the end of history has arrived in the West and Western societies have become wonderfully open, liberal-minded, uh, you know, uh, liberal democracies. There can be threats to liberal democracy in the West as well. Uh, and we should also remember that, I mean, until the Second World War, democracy was not a big norm in Europe. So some of these countries we're talking about actually have a new experience with democracy. So uh, this also puts things in perspective. The other thing is that let's look why they feel, why there's a rise of fascism or these more uh, biased laws like the ban on the minarets in Switzerland, which is very liberal. Why are we having this in Europe? Because Europe, for the first time, for, for a long time, is feeling itself threatened. Oh, new people are coming, there are new powers out there that are threatening us. The thing is, Middle East feels itself threatened for a very long time, from the colonial powers until from Israel and today. So being threatened by a foreign power is always a big recipe for the rise of authoritarianism at home. Uh, let's look at what happened to the United States right after 9-11. Many civil liberties flourished because you know, the fear of terrorism came in. Uh, same thing had happened right after Pearl Harbor, again in the United States, against the Jap Jap Japanese Americans. So, uh, that's why I think this allows us to see that s some trends like fear from the outsider leading to illiberalism at home is universal. It happens to the West as well. And maybe the reason why we have very little democracy in the Middle East so far is that this fear was so powerful for real reasons, colonialism and dictatorships that were supported by the outsiders and all the tensions between Israel and the Arabs when it comes to uh, the Arabic Middle East. But thank you for reminding that. So there's no inherently liberal society on earth uh, or inherently authoritarian. I think their political histories breed some per different cultures here and there and you can have different twists over time. Anything more? I think we're all hungry for lunch. Good. Thank you. Thank you.